everyone. Uh, it is lovely to hear the buzz of people connecting on a bright and sunny and again breezy uh, Saskatchewan late summer day, right? It's not fall yet, late summer. It's still great. I was reminded September 21 is when fall starts, so we're good with that. We can wait for that. Uh, so welcome here. It is it is fantastic to be together, and uh, as you notice here, we're going to be re starting to record our live gatherings, uh, just with the camera on stage, and we're going to post that later for those who aren't able to be here. And tonight we're having our first double service Sunday, so we're going to be meeting at six too. So uh, that'll be that'll be fun. We're getting into a new routine, and uh, again, good to be here together. Uh, one of the things I felt in this last few months is the loss of handshaking. Um, I, I love handshaking and giving hugs to people and, and that physical contact. So that's a that's a struggle for many of us, I know. Um, but one of the greetings that uh, Christians have often passed on to each other is the greeting of peace, which we know in Jesus means means more than just the absence of bad things, but the uh, excitement of all the good that God is doing, the fullness, the completeness, the wholeness that He's bringing. And uh, in, in, in the long Christian tradition, it's been that when you uh, gather together with Christians, we pass the peace to one another. And uh, some of you have been part of churches where that's a formal part of the service, that you pass the peace. Uh, but I thought today, I, I, I was part of a, a gathering recently where they used sign language to pass the peace as a way of greeting and, and even more than that, acknowledging who Jesus is to one another. And uh, so I thought we'd, we'd quickly learn some sign language. How about that, Dave? So this is what I, I understand. I am not fluent in sign language, so here, let's give it a go, okay? So what I'll do is I'll invite you to stand, if, if you can, and uh, here's, here's, let's practice this, and then what, what I'll do is have you just turn in circles and connect eyes with someone and do sign language towards one another and pass the peace out. So peace has two parts. So peace goes like this. You cross your hands and you go like that. That means to become. And then you do this, calm. So you go become calm. That's the peace part. So you go peace. And then to say something to do with, um, you put your fists with your thumbs kind of forward together like that. Okay? So it goes peace, be with, and then you do that. Okay? So let's try one more time. Peace, be with, you. Okay? So turn in circles and connect with someone and Practice saying peace to you. us uh, to be here 
um, as your people, both in this, these walls and around the world. And this morning we ask that we be reminded of that, of the great and indescribable joy that fills our hearts and the hope that drives our lives. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You can remain standing. It's great to see you. Come on up. Sing, pray, sing, pray. 
uh, with the cleaning, all that kind of stuff, and then in the evening you can come back and have a chance and time just to worship together. Um, I know it means more, but it kind of means more from all of us in a way this time. So that's kind of the invitation we're, we're giving, giving out to you. I know I'm imagining the, the youth particularly to maybe help out and volunteer with classes in the morning, um, and then we come gather in the evening. So we're, uh, we're, we're trying to be flexible and, and fluid at the same time. Um, you have your uh, your bulletins there. I encourage you to, to look over those. Um, I know uh, Thrive Campus is Bethany Campus. The Thrive program is gearing up. I want to say like this week or next week. Next week Monday. So I know Sir Alex over here will be going to Thrive, which is awesome. Um, and many other students that will be uh, be joining there. We're gonna have 17 at this time. So we certainly want to be praying and supporting them because just the same, it's, it's a lot of new this year. And our support and encouragement is uh, very valuable. Uh, last one I want to mention is we typically pass around an offering uh, bag at this time, which is for some the chance to financially give tangibly and others the reminder of, oh yeah, I want to do that this week uh, through uh, whether it's through uh, e-transfers, or other ways of giving to the church. Um, we can't be passing around the bag. And we're, me and Rob talked this morning, we might try to find a way to put something near the exit here, so as you need, you can drop something tangible if you want. If you don't have that yet today, you want to do that well as well. Um, do that good as well. Um, but still, online giving, or coming by the church during the week if you are and drop something off, um, those are ways to do that. And, uh, I don't know if we got another almost just the routine of not doing it together. It's been kind of hard to get back into that routine. And so uh, I'm sure some of you are with me in that, uh, but just that, be aware of that. All right. Let me, uh, let me pray. And then uh, what we kind of did last week as well is we have some music on to kind of just pause a little bit before um, Rob or whoever is sharing comes up that morning. Um, just a chance to breathe a little bit and be in the presence of the Lord, and then I'll invite God up when he wants. So, let's pray. Lord, thank you for this morning, for this chance to gather together. Thank you for the way you're working in each one of our lives. I pray that you would be giving us community in new ways this year, uh, with maybe even different people in different situations, that we can be drawn to closer to you by being together. For good conversations of, of uh, encouraging each other and, and asking each other question of, of uh, yeah, how they're experiencing you. you know, we pray that we can be a tangible church in this community this week. You give us the strength and the opportunities to do that with their peers and with strangers. We continue to use the, the funds that we give to further your kingdom, Lord, to make your name made great. Uh, and we continue to want to serve you as we serve this community and each other. Let's pray for humble hearts and servant attitudes in our conversations and our actions. This time together here, in the name we pray. Amen. Oh, 
good. Let's give myself. All right. Uh, on here? Yeah. No, I'm not. That's why. Like <laughs> fell off the back. There we are. Hey, I'm here. Good. Masks and night. Another new thing. All right, uh, today uh, we're talking about a little bit about patterns, and uh, I don't know if you're a person who knows patterns and things, but uh, okay, true confessions here. So last week, it's the first week I was in sitting in here with our new flooring on the on the sanctuary floor here, and uh, I don't know about you, but I started looking for patterns in the flooring. Anybody else done that? Yeah, yeah, huh? okay. Uh, yeah, there, there, there is a pattern, but it's like randomly printed on the different actual, like the, the actual planks don't repeat, but the pattern repeats. You can still find that same knot in different places. So, anybody else like that? Anybody else a pattern person? Yeah, there you go. You, you, you know. <laughs> That's good. We humans are good at picking up patterns, right? Like language is just about recognizing patterns of sounds and, and noises. Um, and we're, you know, those who lived in hunting gatherer cultures, right? You learn the patterns of this berry is not like that berry, so I gotta pick this berry, not that berry. Um, you know, farmers, you're pattern people too, right? You know, it's like, this is a weed, this is a good plant, this is a diseased plant. You know, that's a straight swath, that's not a straight swath, right? <laughs> um, that said, we're, we're pattern people, and we live by patterns, and God in his um, wisdom and uh, amazing design he created these mind brains that we have to be uh, pattern picking out and also pattern living. Like we make these pathways and habits and ways of, of, of living. That's to our advantage, but you know, at times it can be to our disadvantage too. So I brought this mirror today because uh, we're going to, in some ways, it's a little bit of a self preached sermon. So I want to have the mirror to kind of remind us of this, this sermon's a lot directed at me because we're going to be looking at patterns. So I was thinking about a few other patterns that I had in my life. So I brought some learning to tie shoes when I was a kid. So I brought a big rope to kind of show it. So my mom had a way and my dad had a way of tying shoes. And of course it's still just the same old shoe knot, whatever that thing's called. So you do the single granny, right? And then, most people do this, you make a loop, you go around, and then you somehow pull this thing through and make another loop like that. Well, I learned the double loop thing. My mom was like, my mom's way was the double loop. So you make two loops, and then around you go, and boom, and then you got it. And I'm like, well, that's logical, it's supposed to have two at the end, we'll start with two. What's with this, like, kind of thing? So still, today, I kind of feel weird in shoe stores sometimes, you know, trying on shoes or something. Here's me. <laughs> but I can't get out of it, right? Like, that's, that's the way I tie shoes, so it, it makes me think about that. Um, knots are a good thing. Right? Not all knots are patterns. And um, I remember the, the person I learned the trucker's hitch from, um, Dean. He was a foreman of tree climbing when I worked in the bush. And, Dean taught me the trucker's hitch, you know, the simple, don't make a loop that can't come out, make the releasable loop, come around, put it through, and down. And so I, I mean, that's about the only knots I know, I know how to tie my shoes, I know how to do a trucker's hitch. So I do trucker's hitch for like everything. I'm surprised I didn't do a trucker's hitch out there this morning on the ropes I put in the parking lot, because I do that, I put it in, I tighten her down, and really it's designed for loads, but anyway, that's my pattern. You learn patterns and you keep doing these. You learn them from others, right? And uh, you learn to do them a certain way. I can't tie a trucker's hitch from the other side. I have to be kind of facing it, pull it down this way. I can't tie it upside down. Um, I don't know what other patterns. Maybe how you clean jackfish, right? I learned Ron Bolt's pattern on how to tie a jackfish. Uh, or not tie a jackfish. <laughs> clean jackfish. How to get the bones out, right? Um, but I've, I've seen other people have all their different patterns. My point is we all live by patterns. We have these. And we're continually, all our lives, from birth to death, being patterned by other people. Other people are patterning things for us. I probably won't relearn how to tie my shoes at this age. Um, but I'm still being shaped by you around me, and me and you, your life, and, uh, and so on. So it's always worth asking, what are the patterns I'm, I'm taking on, I'm being shaped in? What are the patterns? In my life, what way am I walking? And for that reason, I, I find it super fascinating. You read the New Testament, the first 
label that was put onto these followers of Jesus, the ones who were walking around saying, Jesus risen from the dead, the first label, and it was put on them by their enemies that we read about, is people of the way. People of the way. That's what, that's what they were called. And um, that's interesting. They later they adopted it for themselves. They called themselves the people of the way. And, and I love this. It wasn't just, you know, people of faith, or religious people, or member of such and such church. It's just, we're people of the way. The way of being, the way of doing things. Because Jesus didn't come and say, you know, I'm, I'm the philosophy, the spirituality, and the enlightenment. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so Jesus invited people, he walked around and said, hey, come follow me, let's go this way together. Let's, uh, let's not join a club of some secret knowledge that you know, we share and we have our little signs and things we do. It's not an individual quest for enlightenment. It's joining this like wave of people that are traveling a direction and following a pattern, the way. And this togetherness of movement um, is something we've noticed this summer. We've been looking at this letter of Peter to his Christian friends. It's the first letter of Peter. It's right near the end of Scripture here, First Peter. And we've been noticing that Peter talks about this togetherness, and he's encouraging them because they're they're going. His friends are going through this tough time. They're they're being challenged, um, rejected, pushed away. They're losing their family and friends and teachers. And the times they live in are hard times, which isn't much different from the times of our lives. And Peter challenges them. He says, look, now that you're pushed out, you're outsiders, what kind of outsiders do you see? Are you going to live a compelling, attractive life? Um, is that, that what you can do? And, and, and you can do that when you recognize that you're caught up in this movement, this, this wave, this being moved together. I, I love how Peter summarizes this. We saw this in weeks back in chapter 3, he says this, he says, For Christ also suffered for sin once for all, in order to bring you to God. Do you, do you sense the movement there? It's, that's what joining this Jesus thing is. It's a way, it's a movement, not of our own initiative or strength or goodness, we're so amazing, but there's this movement, we're being brought to God. We're all caught up in it together. So I like this image of waves that I picked for a background. I mean, imagine a set of waves traveling on a surface of water. And each one's unique, right, in size and shape. Um, and what's, you know, carried along in it, what's floating along in the wave. But they're all kind of impelled and pushed by each other and shaped by each other. One wave maybe even crashes over the other, but they're pushing each other along. It's not a perfect metaphor. But it captures in part the way God has designed the way to be. We're to pattern each other in the way. We're all traveling along, being brought to God by Jesus in this pattern. And those who are further ahead are to influence and shape a little bit those who are not quite as far along. Um, and so for each of us, there's always somebody a little bit ahead of us and a little behind us. And they're patterning us. And I'm not talking only in age, because someone much younger than me might be further along the way in this particular area than I am. And I need them to pattern me. And I need to then pattern other people. This mutuality is particularly important in difficult times, because that's when we want to quit and give up, just give in to the patterns of the world around us. And those are the times that Pete's friends were facing. And so he encourages them. He says this right in the last section, the last chapter which we're looking at today of his letter. In 1 Peter 5, verse 5, he says this. In the same way, you who are younger must accept the authority of the elders, or those who are older than you. Now, we've seen this idea before in Peter's letter about accepting authority, about putting yourself under, about being subordinate. And earlier in the letter, he was talking about putting yourself under the social order and the government authorities and coming along with that to make your life attractive. But here he's specifically talking about, okay, the people who are on the way together, 
you need to do this with each other. And deliberately put yourself under the guidance and care of those who are a little bit further along than you are. Um, come under them. Not because of some hierarchy, like they're amazing and so much more worthy or something than you. Simply because that's how Jesus' way works. Uh, you know, we might think of it this way. This whole life of following Jesus, it's a bit like, it's more like an apprenticeship in the trades than it is like a university education. Um, if you want to be an electrician, you find somebody who's a little further along than you are, right? Who's knowledgeable and experienced in playing with wires, or whatever it is electricians do, right there. Um, <laughs> you know, playing with wires. Um, so you come alongside, and you put yourself under, and you let yourself be patterned. Oh, this is how we work with electricity. That's the way that Jesus has designed it to be. And so Peter now takes some time to talk to us about what kind of pattern we should be given to each other. Like what's the pattern I should be patterning for the people around me? So he talks to the elders, to those who are further along. We're going to back up to the start of this chapter, First Peter 5. Right, right from here. First Peter 5, 1 to 4, he says this. Now, as an elder myself, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as one who shares in the glory of the revealed, I exhort the elders among you to tend the flock of God that's in your charge, exercising the oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you do it, not for sordid gain, but eagerly. Do not lord it over those in your charge, but be examples to the flock. When the chief shepherd appears, you'll win a crown of glory that never fades away. In these verses, Peter gives us three little patterns that are to be patterned among us as we're on the way. And, but before we get to those, we're going to look at those three. Uh, before that, we probably should again clarify, come back to this word elders. Like, what is Peter talking about when he says elders? What is, what is it that elders are to do? Like, Peter's word isn't a rare word. He's just using a normal word for older people. Okay. Um, but in ancient cultures, like in indigenous cultures, um, elder carries some weight. They, an older person has authority and is worthy of respect because of the wisdom that comes with life. And in ancient Jewish culture, like all the ancient cultures, elders were given special roles and places. And so in the synagogues, the Jewish gathering places, elders, an elder was a specific position, a role you were given oversee that. And so, the early Christian movement, because it was Jewish in origin, they followed that pattern. And so the apostles, when they went around and started churches, they said, hey, let's put an elder here and an elder there. Let's appoint elders. Um, so yes, Peter's talking here partly to a formal position in the church. He's saying, you elders, particularly they were men in that cultural context, men who had a formal role of being in the church. And so, by analogy, we might go forward today to say, oh, people who are, you know, paid in ministry leadership positions, like pastors and directors, etc., um, or people who are lay people who serve in leadership roles in the church, our leadership council, our various teams that oversee what we do. So yes, there's a parallel there. But, 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 hear my but, as I hinted earlier, I think what Peter's talking about applies to all of us. Um, because each of us is further along than somebody else. Somebody behind us, no matter how old or what state we're at, even in our faith journey, there's somebody a little bit behind you. And so we're all a little bit elder. And, and I think this partly because of what, what Peter encourages elders to do. What does he say? He says to them to literally, to shepherd the flock of God. To, to shepherd. Supposed to shepherd. And Jesus, once when he was traveling around, he was walking around Galilee, and Matthew tells us that when Jesus saw the crowds around him, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. So, my thinking is this who's the flock among you? Well, for each of us, it's the crowds the people in our lives. It's the harassed and helpless people all around us. 
And I'm going to suggest that we're supposed to follow and imitate Jesus, and following Jesus living his way involves shepherding others, having love and compassion like Jesus did for those who were harassed and helpless who were wandering around without the shepherd. Which might include the guy across the aisle from you. It might include your co-worker who's struggling with depression. It might include your laid-off neighbor. It might include that lady you know who's entering the stage of a, a certain stage of dementia, whatever it is. The harassed and helpless. And we're all called to be shepherds or pastors. That's all a pastor means. Pastor means shepherd. So I think we're all invited into this. So, so I, want, I, I invite you to listen along, okay? And say, oh, what's, this in, what's in this for me? Where am I being a shepherd to someone else? Uh, someone who models and cares for me. But, okay, now here's the but again, going back in the other way. Um, you, part of this church, have invited me, and Greg, and Kelsey Lynn, particularly to be in ministry leadership roles. Okay, to be, you, you say, take, don't work. We'll pay for your lives, and you need to go do this not working somewhere else. Okay, so you've told that to us. So these words are particularly poignant for me and Samir. Um, that, that I'm like, ooh, I gotta listen to these, because these are directed straight at me. Um, so I'm gonna use my mirror kind of as an illustration, but I, I wanna just remind myself, I'm gonna kind of try to take these personally as best I can and speak a bit that way, okay? So we're going to look at these three pairs of patterns. So he gives a negative and a positive. He goes back and forth and gives three of them. Or the elders, or anybody who's further along, what's the pattern? So first, he says, not under compulsion. Um, now, I never wanted to be a pastor. I even put that in my cover letter when I applied for this job at this church. I don't want to be a pastor. Um, <laughs> see if that works for you in your next job. Um, for me, it was a, an act of obedience, simply put, to come under Jesus. And I don't, but I don't think Peter here is talking about that. I don't think he's saying obedience isn't a good thing. I think Peter's all about obedience to the Lord. But I think what Peter's getting at are the self expectations, the shoulds we put on ourselves, right? I should be doing this, X and Y and Z. I should be so much better than that. Oh, I failed again. I should, I should be doing it. It's easy for those of us who've been trying to follow Jesus for a while to allow our lives to become driven by the shoulds. Well, a good Christian should do this, so it makes it better. It's, it's obligation, it's false guilt. Like, oh, okay, I'll help you. That's what a good Christian would do, but I really don't want to do it, and I don't really like you anyway, but, um, right? Um, I'll just feel bad if I don't do this. Is that what drives us? Is that the life that Jesus promised us? Now, guilt is okay. Sometimes guilt feels like a, that light on your dash that tells you something pretty wrong. You're going, Whoa. guilt's okay. But false guilt um, has to do often with my performance, right? Specifically, what others perceive as my performance. Right? When I look around and go, oh, how does everybody think about me as a Christian? How oh, am I doing? Am I looking good? Oh, I should do that because then they'll like what I'm doing. And then that's, that's slavery, that living for performance, living for perfection, living for perception of others. That's slavery and legalism. Don't live by that pattern, Peter's saying. Don't, don't live under compulsion. But he says, instead, he says, shepherd the people around you willingly, and like God would want it to be. Like, instead of perception, we can live in the freedom of love. We know, oh, God loves me. I don't have to impress God. I'm, not, I'm free not to perform and get it all perfect, but to forget about myself and actually get on busy loving people. Busy with that. Love, 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 and go on. So, I think that's what Peter's getting at. So, I'll look at myself. Well, on my good days, I think I'm, I'm getting there, making progress a little bit, but then performance slips in so easily for me. Leanne and I have an ongoing conversation about, you know, when I'm shooting on myself, is what we say. Um, 
you know, until somebody's asking, Rob, why are you so compelled to do this? Why are you? Um, yeah, okay, I'm just doing it with that, not out of the freedom of being loved and wanting to love others. So, there we go. Second one, Peter says, we should shepherd others not for sordid gain. I like that phrase, sordid gain, evil money. Um, this is a trap for those of us who definitely get paid to be a Christian. <laughs> it's, it's weird. It's just weird. And, and I'm not just talking about American television preachers with their private jets. Um, there's, a, there's a risk here. Like, it's, I'm just honest here. Like, there's a risk that you get into this sort of feeling where you're, oh, I'm happy. I people, I'm keeping people happy. They keep paying me. Hey, it's a good gig. Not bad. And it's subtle. It's very subtle. It's very easy to get comfortable with a paycheck. And so this is one where I need to look honestly in the mirror first morning. Uh, but it goes beyond money too, um, because we can do ministry or help people or do good things in the community uh, just for the pleasure and comfort, the kickback we get out of it. Um, and that cuts to the heart. Like, why am I helping and serving others? Is it really for others, or is it what I'm getting? Instead, Peter says, we're to care for others, we're to shepherd others eagerly, he says. Eagerly. Um, with the a generosity that is appropriate for someone who's received more than enough from God. God's given us everything we need, so we can just go and give. We're not trying to arrange life for our own pleasure and comfort. By trying to be good to do that. God loved me with his whole self to the point of giving up his life. Am I caught up in that way of doing it? Of Jesus' way? Or am I am I actually passing on the pattern that, hey, being a Christian is a very pleasant and comfortable life? Is that the pattern I'm modeling for others? It's particularly challenging for all of us North Americans, because we think we have the right to be comfortable. And right now we're uncomfortable in this pandemic, and we don't like it. Um, so, the way of Jesus begins with the unbelievable generosity of God. So, am I going to live out of that fullness? Am I going to live eagerly and enthusiastically? I'm like, I've got everything I need from God. Woohoo! Let's go! So, finally, the third, Peter says, don't lord it over, he says, those whom God has placed in your life. Um, as Peter pointed out earlier, he used the word oversight. Right? Whenever you're shepherding and caring for someone, you're kind of helping oversee what they're doing. That's what shepherds do. Um, we watch out for others. And it starts with, you know, legitimate care and concern. Oh dear, oh, that's so bad. I'm so sad for you in your life. I'll pray for you, et cetera, et cetera. But then it really subtly can slide into the tisk, tisk, tisk. Look at those bad choices you're making, or. You know, I would never do that. And all of a sudden, I'm just a little bit higher. Oh, I'm concerned about you, but I'm not you. And it's, ooh, that's hard. That is, that, is a, that is a nasty trap. And any time we're trying to model and encourage and care for others. Um, once I see myself above you, then it easily you slide into this little bit of power, a little bit of control of other people, trying to fix them, trying to make them better. Jesus' friends, his own disciples, argue right in front of him about who is the best disciple. And Jesus says, what? He says, well, the kings of the world, they do that. They lord it over. But not so with you. Instead, the greatest among you must be like the least or the youngest. Not so with you, Jesus says. It's not my way. And Peter says this again. He says, you should be examples to the flock. Not lording it over, but examples to the flock. Now, I don't know if you caught, catch this, but to me there's humor here. Because, like, if you just think about it for a minute, do shepherds go around giving examples to sheep? Like, the shepherd get down and go, this is how you eat grass, guys. Mm, this is how, that's my cud. Mm, that's tasty. Um, like, <laughs> we don't do that, right? I, human shepherds don't do that for sheep. So. That's exactly Peter's point, though. That's his point. His point is all of you elders, you important people in the church, you're sheep too. 
you're sheep. You're sheep, you're sheep, you're sheep. You're all sheep. Um, you're not a different species destined to rule over other people. Um, so instead of lording it over, you need the one of the flock kind of humility, which means, okay, I'll get down in the grass with the lambs, and this is how you roll in the grass, guys, it's awesome. Woo. Whatever sheep do, I don't know what sheep do. <laughs> yeah, um, because as he points out, like in verse 4, we talked about a chief shepherd, right? Because we're all sheep. Jesus is our shepherd. And then we have a role of kind of patterning and shepherding and caring for each other. Um, but don't lord it over. Just get down the grass and be a sheep with the other sheep. So, mirror. How am I doing? Am I living under guilt and obligation? Or am I living freely with this willingness? Am I trying to arrange my own comfort and pleasure on an ongoing basis? Or am I doing it Jesus' way, just eagerly living with open hands? And how am I doing in terms of lording it over, seeing myself as just a little above everyone? Or am I willing to get down in the grass? I have lots to learn. I'm grateful to some of you who are modeling these things for me. I need you. And I'm praying that in God's grace I can model some of this to others. So I don't know about you. How are you doing with those three? Are you patterning for the people that God's put in your life? Are you, are you modeling the pattern of Jesus, which Jesus himself didn't consider equality with God to be grasped? All helpless, but took the form of a slave and humbled himself out, even to the point of death on the cross. Because it's Jesus that Peter has in mind. That's the pattern. And that's why he closes this way. This is his closing of this section. Um, picking it up again in the middle of verse 5. Peter says this. Or, sorry, in verse. Institutional life, he himself was the minister of the church, leads to hypocrisy. Because we who offer spiritual leadership often find ourselves not living what we're preaching or teaching. It's not easy to avoid hypocrisy completely because wanting to speak in the name of God, the church, or the larger community, we find ourselves saying things larger than ourselves. I often call people to a life that I'm not fully able to live myself. I'm learning that the best cure for hypocrisy is community. When as a spiritual leader I live close to those I care for, and when I can be criticized in a loving way by my own people and be forgiven for my own shortcomings, then I won't be considered a hypocrite. Hypocrisy is not so much the result of not living what I preach, but much more of not confessing my inability to follow the love to my own words. I need to become a pastor who asks forgiveness, of my people and my mistakes. I'm thankful even for Henry Allen who has patterned things for me through his writings. Um, humility, that's what I see in that. That's humility, even in the practice of confessing to one another. 
and admitting where we've been wrong. That's, that's the kind of humility he was talking about. Not lording it over, just getting down and doing it. So, when I fail to live up to what I preach, please tell me. Um, I want to know that. And I'm thankful for people in my life that I can regularly go to and confess to. So I don't know if you have that as well. That's part of the practice of humility, is admitting where you have to make it. It's a mutuality along the way. Like waves were carried and shaped by one another. And it's all under this great movement of Jesus bringing us to God. Infinite grace and unending love. Join with me in prayer. Father, um, thank you again for the words that you inspired Peter to write so long ago. Thank you for the one another aspect of the way you call us to live. That we're not alone in this journey of following Jesus. We have one another, and we get to join the way. Lord, we admit we don't always pattern well for each other. We show each other a wrong picture of who God is. So continue to call us out, change us, transform us in your image. Make us like you. Make us people of love in this community, even in this week ahead. We pray this in the name of the Father, whose love is over all, in the name of the Son, who showed us the way, and in the name of the Spirit, who filled us. Amen. So, who's, who are you teaching to tie their shoes? And uh, who's teaching you to tie your shoes? No. Who are you looking to to learn a new knot from uh, this week? Because that's the issue about giving ourselves to the pattern that's in front of us. Uh, so I'll leave you with that and with peace be with you. Peace be. Oh, okay, good. There we go. Peace be with you. Sign language for each other. May you go into the week with that peace. Um, we're going to be dismissed um, in two places today because we have people in the balcony and on the main floor. So uh, our ushers will come and kind of lead you row, row by row. And uh, so in the balcony, we'll start from the back. And you can go down the stairs and out the door you came in, and out to this parking lot. And uh, this this part of the sanctuary, we're going to go up this front door and uh, we'll go row by row and the old bar can kind of point you in that way. And uh, outside, Please remember to just find some distance from each other. We actually roped off a larger section uh, so we can spread out and respect each other's space and uh, connect with one another. So grab your jackets, head outside. <laughs>